for the sake of time, I have to proceed uh, to introduce my, my dear uh, son and brother, Ahmed bin Dari, for inflammation and atherosclerosis is a cat. Uh, we are trying to answer a very interesting question uh, about the, the relation uh, between inflammation and atherosclerosis. Are we chasing our tails? Is the cat chasing our tail or not? First, I'd like to start by a fact. Inflammation is an integral part of atherosclerosis. Suffice to know that everything in the atherosclerotic process speaks about inflammation. First, the recruitment of leukocytes within the nascent inflammatory plaques or atherosclerotic plaques is mediated through selectines and integrins. Those are inflammatory markers. Also, the monocyte colony stimulating factor which is responsible for the maturation of macrophages and scavenger receptor engulfing of LDL to become foam cells. This is inflammation. Moreover, the interaction between local T lymphocytes and macrophages is also responsible for the overexpression, is also responsible for the overexpression of the local tissue factor, which is responsible finally for the atherothrombotic complication. So, everything in atherosclerosis speaks simply about inflammation. And we do have evidence from prospective studies that links high sensitivity CRP as an inflammatory marker to the future risk of incident cardiovascular events. Not only this, take that. We have also a relation between the total cholesterol and the quintiles of high sensitivity CRP and the future risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. Suffice to know that those patients who were in the highest quintile of high sensitivity CRP and at the same time in the highest quintile of total cholesterol HDL ratio showed the highest propensity to develop atherothrombotic event in the future. And if we went back to the old statin studies, the AF caps, text caps. Look to this, the highest category which can experience a future atherothrombotic event are those patients with both high LDL and high sensitive CRP. Not only this, the number needed to treat is the highest, which means in other ways that the mission becomes much more difficult in those patients that show the highest level of inflammatory markers and the highest value of LDL. And now let's take the picture broader and let's look to the cascade of interleukin-1 which is the most important inflammatory marker in atherosclerosis. Interleukin-1 has a peculiar mechanism of auto-induction. It can auto-induce itself. And then this leads to increased expression of interleukin sex, which stimulates the liver to produce many acute phase reactants. One of them is high sensitive CRP. I agree that this is very important for the inflammatory defensive mechanism, but at the same time, this could impair fibrinolysis and put the patient at high risk for atherothrombotic events. And if I am going to speak about one subtype of interleukin-1, I will go for interleukin-1 beta. Because this molecule acts on many cells, one of these cells is the endothelial cell itself, in addition to some smooth muscles and even the monocytes or macrophages. This interleukin-1 beta also can lead to overexpression of matrix metalloproteinase 2 which is otherwise known as collagenase type 4. And this is the molecules responsible for the acute plaque change, which is by, I mean, plaque erosion or plaque rupture. And this is the underpinning of the pathophysiologic acute myocardial infarction. And I'd like to point here to a very, very smart molecule called the inflammasome. In simple terms, inflammasomes are just sensors. They sense many danger processes, such as the LDL crystals, even the microbiological uh, products, the hypoxia, the disturbed flow. Inflammasomes are just sensors. Once those inflammasomes 
Since these danger signals, they convert the brew interleukin-1 beta, which is inactive, to its active form that sweat 17 kilodalton in order to produce the cascade of inflammation. What I'd like to say is that the caspase enzyme, which is the enzyme responsible for the conversion of the inactive interleukin-1 beta to its active form, is largely dependent on this inflammasome, the sensor, like the sensor in your car. If it was corrupted, your car will stop. And it goes without saying that the active player in the inflammatory process is interleukin-6. Here I'd like to point to the idea that interleukin-6 can enhance the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And this in and of itself can lead to more stress, more obesity, more insulin resistance, with the known pathological downstream cascade of this process. So, it makes full sense that if we could stop the centers of interleukin-1, or at least block its action through whatever such as antibodies, we can obtain many beneficial effects over the endothelial cells, the smooth muscle cells, even hepatocytes, acute phase reactants, and even on carcinogenesis and the tumorogenesis. But how could we do that? Let's, take to, let's look to this very important figure. This figure speaks about the different drugs that we could use in order to block the action of the different inflammatory markers. Starting with canakinumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-1 beta. And then the anakinura, which is a blocker of the interleukin-1 receptor. And who could forget Tocilizumab. This is the Actemra used widely in the era of COVID. This is a blocker for the interleukin-6 receptor. And also we should not forget the broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory medications, especially methotrexate and colchicine. Actually, colchicine acts by a very smart way. Colchicine inhibits the formation of the microtubules which are responsible, do you remember the sensor, the inflammasome? If the inflammasome didn't work, the interleukin-1 beta will not be activated. We will not obtain interleukin-6, and this could block the inflammatory response underpinning the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis. And I will show you now data about the benefit of colchicine for improving cardiovascular outcomes in patients with atherosclerosis. And let's look at first to these two important trials. I put them aside to compare and contrast them. The first was the Kentus trial, which randomized more than 10,000 patients post-acute myocardial infarction in addition to a high sensitive CRP more than two between receiving two different doses of canakinumab and placebo, follow-up of more than four years, and boom, a significant 17% reduction in the mace end point associated with significant reduction of inflammatory markers. However, the third trial, which randomized similar but more stable patients between receiving a small dose of methotrexate and placebo, big failure, not even a reduction in the inflammatory markers. So I'd like to say that here we have two trials using two different anti-inflammatory molecules. One is very positive and the other is neutral. Do you think that this is intriguing? Yes, this is intriguing. Colchison in stable patients post-acute myocardial infarction in the LUDUCO2 trial, which randomized more than 5,500 patients post-MI between colchicine and placebo, significant reduction in the miss in the point with a very small number needed to treat, just 36 patients. Colco trial, more stable patients randomized between receiving colchicine and placebo. I think the number of patients here was 4,700. Long-term follow-up up to 28 months, significant reduction in the intention to treat analysis. 
So we have now two trials testing colchicin both in patients with acute and chronic atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that came positive. So I do think that the guidelines will endorse this evidence. Not exactly that. If we look into the diabetes guidelines issued by the European Society of Cardiology in collaboration with the European Association of the Study of Diabetes, EASD, we will find that they stated that routine assessment of circulating biomarkers is not recommended. The same in the 2021 cardiovascular prevention guidelines, no recommendation to evaluate inflammatory markers. And even the evidence, or let us say the level of evidence and recommendations behind colchicine is very small. It's class 2P indications. Only in patients who remain symptomatic, developing recurrent CV events despite care, and in those patients whose other risk factors are not controlled. What happened? Even the Cantus trial, when the guidelines are trying to endorse this trial, they say to us that this particular drug was, however, not fertilely developed due to the risk of fatal infections and high cost. My take home message and questions to the panel for the sake of time. We have progressed a lot through the inflammation and the atherosclerosis interplay, but a very important question remains. Why is there a gap in the practice? Why is there a gap in the guidelines? But we should remain optimistic that there are ongoing trials testing this hypothesis, but at the end of the day, I think that we are still chasing our tails. It's now the time for the panel to discuss why this discrepancy between the guidelines and practice and what have been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Give me the, uh, the questions here. Okay, uh, Dr. Mohammed, I will swell. Behind the success, there are still some questions that need to be addressed. Why if there is a gap in practice? Why if there is a gap in the guidelines? A gap in practice uh, because you have to be convinced by the guidelines. You are concentrating on the guidelines. But regarding colchicine, I'm starting to use colchicine. You know this uh, since be one and a half year after the, the yes. cold cut trial. And the, because already there is evidence and the guideline is class 2B. I'm using this if there is a recurrent event of the patients, a part of the residual risk of these patients, so I have to add this colchicine because it's low cost drug. Uh, can you come? It's, it's very expensive, I cannot use it. It acts on 1B, uh, it's 1-6 one six, one six failed, yes. which is the low dose uh, methotrexate. All tocilizides, uh, six drugs failed. Maybe in the future, the drugs called, called uh, uh, acting on uh, CRP, it's called, uh, uh, it is MR, MRCRP. This could be in the future a, a good drug. Uh, when to use it, depending on the clinical, on the biomarkers, there is, as they say, the guideline, there is no biomarker to say if there is a C high CRP, uh, this indication could be seen. But for myself, I'm doing this on just clinical grounds. It's because I'm looking to the last guideline, 2BA. Yeah. Adding to me. I didn't want to break you, but of course, since this is very close to my heart, this excellent presentation, by the way, thank you very much. I would completely agree, it's, uh, it's underappreciated. Uh, we have two outcome trials that are strikingly positive. Yes, of course, they didn't, they didn't uh, uh, show the gold standard of total mortality. That's probably, you know, taking it down a little bit, but, but still we have consistent effects in two outcome trials. We only have a small trial, the covert MI, that showed if you give it directly peri-interventionally uh, peri in the ACS, you may not end up with a positive effect, but uh, in no comparison in the, in the collective size. So I think what we see here, and I may speak this out a little bit more prominently, is we don't have big companies behind the drug of colchicin that are pushing it into daily practice, and that is a big problem. Yes. But of course, uh, Mohamed Sopti, you are absolutely right. 
Um, but, but there is one gap we still need to close because we needed to know, can we further increase the outcome effect in a collective that would be such as Cantos pre-selected for HSCRP? This is something we, we still don't have. Thank you, Andreas. Ashraf? Uh, for, for any inflammation, inflammation is an important part of the mechanism of atherosclerosis. This is fact. Yes. But for any inflammation, there is a target. Either you treat the target or you give anti-inflammatory medications. So first of all, we have to uh, do our effort in treating the what is the target? What is the cause of inflammation? The cause of the inflammation is the bad LDL particles, is the hypertension, is the diabetes, is the bad lifestyle. This is the cause of, if we reduce the LDL as much as we can, it will reduce the inflammation. So that's why I think why anti-inflammatory drugs did, did not show the uh, expected benefit, despite we know that there is inflammation. Uh, uh, okay, uh, actually, uh, what's, what's with Colchicina, I totally agree with, with Dr. Zerg. It's not industry uh, backed up. So uh, it's a cheap drug. It's a well-known under practice in acute uh, gouty arthritis. We, we all know it. We all use it in such situations. But we all know its side effects. So the, all the studies are using a low dose colchicine because you know with the, with the full dose you might have some side effects. I don't know what will happen if we use a therapeutic dose of colchicine. Would it be more effective? Would it be more uh, reproducible in results? I don't know. And I don't know what's the study used the doses, what were the doses? Half uh, milligram? The, the doses recommended... I know, half is, milligram, but where, yeah. where the high doses? I don't know. Uh, 0.5 milligram once daily. Uh, thank you. I just want to repeat what Professor Ad... Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I just want to repeat what Professor Ad Tribi and what um, Andreas Zerlich just said. Um, that I, and I want to add a couple of points. The first one is that in Egypt, because of the endemic nature of familial Mediterranean fever, uh, many of us are very, very familiar and even have family members who are on colchicine. And this is the smallest dose. This is one tablet a day. So the side effects on, on this small dose are very, very little. Even in, we give colchicine to very young people. So I just want to ask everybody in this room one important thing. How many reps walked into your clinic after the two trials and spoke to you about colchicine? How many parties and dinners were you invited for by pharma to discuss the data on colchicine? Excellent. Zero. And that just shows that our practice is pharma driven and it's a shame. And we should be careful when we have such data and we're not using it, uh, we put ourselves in a very bad description. Excuse me, Professor Raghi, just, just one sentence. This reminds me about the story uh, of metformin yes. in type 2 diabetes. Uh, no yeah. industry is pushing it now. So, well, I, I, I wanted to make it... Christoph, please. No, I just wanted to make a point. We always uh, talk about vascular inflammation and LDL causing the, the elevated inflammation we see, but I think that's not entirely true because we see even if we control LDL levels in some patients that there's still some inflammation and we have to distinguish between what is happening in the vasculature but also what is happening potentially in the liver, metabolic inflammation, lifestyle-mediated inflammation. So there is a true... Uh, possibility to have this as an add-on treatment and not something that is anyway controlled but what we always cause the, uh, consider the cause of inflammation. Clearly LDL causes inflammation in the vascular wall but there's this metabolic inflammation aspect that we have to always consider. So therefore I think that has to be kept in mind. So the idea, the idea is to use, why it is a gap? Because you don't have biomarkers. I mean I'm, I'm teaching atherosclerosis. Sir Ashraf said but depending LDL, okay, LDL is, is low, but the patient has recurrent events. What the next? Yes. This is called the residual risk. So we have residual risk depending on clinical. Yes. If you are depending on CRP from the beginning, yes. you can give it from the beginning, but they are not doing this. Yes. The guidelines say 2B. If there is recurrent events, give this low dose of drug. Thank That's you. it. Thank you. Yes, I want so, to, uh, so. as, uh, please. 
uh, as uh, Dr. Professor uh, Dr. Ashraf Rida say, uh, inflammation is a cornerstone in atherosclerotic process. فهو الاثروسكلوروزيس لما نيجي نقول ان هو هيستخدم هيقارن بين الكوليشيسين وبين الميسوتريكسيت مثلا الميسوتريكسيت بالرغم ان هو انتي انفلاماتوري اقوى ما جابش نتائج في الفاميليا المترينيان فيفر الكوليشيسين بيستخدم لكن ما ينفعش قد غيره كانتي انفلاماتوري هو الكوليشيسين بالاسم اللي بيجيب نتائج في في حالات برضو زي اللي هي الجاوت هو بالذات الكوليشيسين اللي بيجيب نتائج فاعتقد ممكن ما يكونش كانتي انفلاماتوري لانه كمان هو اتجرب في حالات الروماتيك فيفر يعني في ستاديز اتعملت على الروماتيك فيفر مع الكوليشيسي فاعتقد انه ممكن يكون حاجه ثانيه مش لازم الانتي انفلاماتوري باي اتس مين دليل ان الميسوتوكسيت ما بيجيبش نتائج دليل ان الانتي انفلاماتوري الاخرى ما بتجيبش نتائج في الفاميليا شكرا يا دكتور احمد ثانك يو سمول بوينتس هو ذا ستاديز ويز دان ويز 0.5 ملي جرام Uh, the full dose is Dear doctor, dose. your so time is up. The subtherapeutic dose, and so we can't judge it's, it's beneficial or not. Thank you very much.